Welcome everybody to this year's, I think, most critical webinar. It's about water reform in Australia. Hi, my name's Trevor Piller. I'm the National Partnerships Manager here at Iceform, and we're delighted that so many have joined us today from all around the country and from other countries, uh, mostly Australia and most states, and a group in the Northern Territory, you might see on your screen, they're coming in as we speak. Sherry, it's great to have you with us and your team from Department of Environment and Natural Resources in Darwin. Uh, welcome. I see you're taking your seat, seats now as, as you come in. It's great to have you with us. Um, you can see on the screen right now what we're doing. Uh, in, the, in the coming months, we've had 15 to 20 of these webinars already over the last 12 months, but we've got a lot more coming up. They're free webinars uh, and also, of course, some face-to-face -face, uh, short courses, which I'll speak about more later. Today, it's a simple format, 25 minutes presentation by Dr. John Williams, and then 25 minutes Q&A open to everybody. Today's attendees, as you can see, from all around Australia, uh, and a big group from Northern Territory, actually the, the dot's in the wrong spot, probably should, oh, there it is up in Darwin, up there, there we go, somebody from Alice Springs as well, um, and a couple from overseas, uh, a great crew, great team of people listening in today. I'm not going to spend any more time in the introduction, we're going to go straight into uh, introducing uh, Dr. John Williams. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic that John could join us. Um, uh, John could present this uh, webinar today. Uh, he's the um, adjunct professor at Australian National University, uh, Crawford School of Public Policy. You can see on the screen there. I won't go through the, the whole lot, but what impresses me and gets my attention is point number one. Dr. John Williams grew up on a farm in Snowy Mountains. Uh, he's got my attention immediately. When I see that dot point there, John, I think of this, this, this uh, little, little uh, quote uh, I mentioned earlier. A reformer is one who sets forth cheerfully toward, sheer, toward sure defeat. <laughs> it yeah, that doesn't, that. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't build a lot of confidence, but I'm sure we're going to get there. The other one is people who love soft methods uh, and hate iniquity forget that reform consists in taking a bone from a dog. Taking a bone from a dog. Philosophy will not do it. And that's, that's an American author and reformer, John Chapman. <laughs> I think I've probably said enough, but there was a lot more in that introduction that I should have said about the honorary reward, uh, the honoured with awards uh, from the Farrah Memorial Medal and also a fellow of the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering. I think probably I could say a lot more, John, about years and years of your work in Australian uh, water. Where we are today is a direct result of you and your colleagues' work. I'm going to hand right over to you. Trevor, thank you very much and thank you for all the work behind the scenes to at Ice Warm and at the Australian Water School to make it possible for uh, me to be able to talk to you. I'm uh, really pleased to be able to talk to you and I, the topic I want to talk about I think is terribly, terribly important to Australians. It's, um, it's one that probably we think has all happened. We've done our effort on water reform and new policy on water. I've heard a lot about it in the past. My judgment is, however, that we've uh, gone into a stagnant period and that we need to bring into being, get back on the bike of uh, water reform, uh, policy development to set us up well for the future so that we can give Australians a sense of security in terms of access to water and the good economic use of water and the good environmental use of that water. You see, why I'm concerned is if uh, I guess I've seen a fair bit water pass under the bridge, to say. It's just about three years now since the chair of the Council of Australian um, Governments uh, presented to the Prime Minister the National Water Commission's fourth and final assessment of progress with the National Water Initiative. In fact, it was given on the 22nd of September by Carleen Maywald on uh, 2014, which was some time after uh, the um, decision to abolish the NRC, NWC. This comprehensive independent report analysed and urged the Prime Minister to take a lead and drive the political process to initiate the next generation of water reform and delivered a 10-point plan that uh, would be the basis of that plan a policy that was fundamentally important to Australians who, as we all know, dwell in the driest continent with the highest climatic variability on the planet and now seen as one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. Well, it's, it's, it's three years since that statement was made and there has just been no action. 
in fact, a whole lot of actions to suggest very strongly that we're gone backwards in the sense of preparing for the future. The first signals appeared in, 19, in 2013 when the decision to abolish the National Water Commission and disband the COAG Standing Committee on Environment and Water, which was the peak body for coordination of government action on water, water reform and the development of national and, in, and, and, and policy across the states. This policy uh, is so important uh, because we see evidence of the success in the early period of having policy in place for water trading and uh, ability to transfer from licenses to entitlements and trade that water. One of the things we can see that through the millennium drought, the Australian economy was able to go through that drought with very little impact on its agricultural production. There was some, 5% or so, but most of that, and Mark Kirby's work illustrates that much of that was achieved because water reform had been put in place before the millennium drought and were able to use water trading, which through that period meant we accommodated the drought with little economic damage. That's just one example, and there are many, many more of the benefits of having put in place prior to the situation good policy on water. So despite the um, fact that we had that very good report from the National Water Commission, but in 2013, the decision to abandon the committee, commission and the COAG agreements, which I've talked about, have meant that we've really gone into a period of stagnation. One of the first people to bring this attention to everyone that we had gone into a policy stagnant period was the Academy of uh, Technological Sciences and Engineering. And in 2014, we prepared a statement which called on the government to develop and commit to a renewed long-term national water reform agenda. ADSI proposed a way to include and implement a whole range of arrangements for collaboration among governments and to develop and set the agenda for national water reform, which would include a forward reform for urban water, vitally important. We saw what happened when you didn't really have good urban water planning and policy in place. We have many capitals putting large expenditure into desalination plants, which may not have been the most cost effective way of responding to the periods of drought that we have. Western Australia, perhaps that is the case, that was a good call. But we need to have policy and planning that helps us get through these changes as climate change becomes more and more exercised on the way we are. So the national priorities for managing water in the other sectors, particularly in the mining sector and the gas sector, national principles for water management in Northern Australia, very important to see if we can keep to the NWI and develop it appropriately for Northern Australia. A national strategy and priorities for water science and research. Much of the gain we had with water policy was and can be contributed, uh, attributed to the fact that it was built on a good scientific and social science and economic base. There'd been a lot of good research during that period of the uh, 90s and into the 2000s, up to 2005, where we had two CRCs, at least, focused on water, and an irrigation CRC, a whole range of activity in CSIRO and the universities and state agencies, where we accumulated over that time a large body of very good knowledge set, which was a foundation to a lot of the water policy development and reform that was put in place. So we must keep doing that. And there's every evidence that this is on the way and we need to turn that around. That is, national strategies for water science and its research. We also need natural princi national principles for the best use of environmental water and implementing new arrangements for the ongoing leadership, monitoring, assessment and evaluation of reform progress. Without the National Water Commission or a suite of similar structures, we, we are, up, are up the creek without a paddle. And that's something that the Academy very strongly feels about. But it wasn't only the Academy, the water industries themselves 
in 2004, it stated the same sort of thing. We needed to get and continue to have an active program of policy development on the management of water. It's not something you can do once and then walk away from. Water policy development is an ongoing process as we learn and as we build that into good policy and its implementation. And the AWA people uh, said there was a readiness in industry for renewed water reform to improve operational efficiency in the water sector, drive investment in asset uh, management, upgrades and augmentation while clarifying the governance in the, urban, in the urban sector. And to tackle the emerging issue of climate change as posing a significant risk to the sustainable management of water. That's the industry. And of course, the Wentworth Group came to the table at the same time that year and said, it appears our Australian governments are walking away from strategic water reform at the very time when we should be preparing for the next drought. They gave a very detailed report and in the light of time, Trevor, I won't go into it, but happy to have questions to that, that detailed 10 year program at least and some of the big issues that needed to be addressed. The first step in that whole process, according to the Wentworth Group, was that all governments to commit to an updated, reinvigorated National Water Initiative Agreement with a focus on completing unfinished tasks and incorporating responses to the emerging water issues, those in the mining and gas sectors and of climate change and population growth. So they put forward a, a range of exercises and we can go into those, but I don't think time's going to let me do that. But while that was happening, another group of people in social science and economics and, and legal side of, of intellectual knowledge around water published a whole range of papers in this period where they made it very clear that what we'd done so far had many, very many, many good attributes, but they found in it quite a number of flaws that needed attention. And this was uh, in the literature, so we have a maturing academic literature which has reviewed the learnings of the last 10 years of water reform. And these people like Carmody, Holly, Sinclair and Extras have set down a convincing case for an urgent rekindling of water reform. So in their well-argued case that they published in 2016, they again provide the fashion of another 10-point plan. Many of it similar, but some of it not so similar. They raise issues that I think are quite important to them. They raise legal issues about the fundamental legal assumptions of current water policy on property rights, whether the actual allocation is a property right or not a property right, and how that allocation and entitlement is actually dealt with is under needs some revision and further development. So that's a pretty important thing, that some of the foundations of what we've done before need to be strengthened and girded in the legal sense, as well as uh, issues in the biophysical sense. So it's to me, at this point in time, uh, by the end of 16, it was abundantly clear that water policy reform had stopped. And some of the key areas are to repeat that is important to build it forward. The changing climate will have a major impact on both availability of water and the demand for water across Australia. Climate change needs to be built into our water planning and water use decisions and water users and governments and investors can, so they can make long-term informed decisions on investment and adaption strategies. That's missing, that's missing. Climate change is not built in to the NWI and the current situation at all. Certainly not in the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, but I don't believe it's in what the state plans have uh, implemented either. Someone can correct me if I've overlooked that. The mining industry, and the petroleum industries, the carbon sequestration industry, need to be brought into the whole exercise on water policy and reform. Particularly when we know that 
<clears throat> energy, food and water are closely connected and when you pull one thread of one, you influence the other. So we need to have policy that recognises the, the nexus and interplay of food, water and energy and the environment. And currently they do not. So over that period, we've got some major issues which we need to do. And I think as Australians, we've got a good track record of industry and uh, in research institutions and government, state and federal, working together to put us on the front foot. And we have some very good water policy in Australia. We need to keep it good by looking at it and making sure it's working for all these new circumstances that I've just introduced. But we need to think about the governance and the leadership for the next stage of water policy development for Australia. I find it really strange to see us have abolished in the 2014 budget the NWC and at the same time the independent COAG review uh, of the Commission. Because in, in 2012, when that Commission was reviewed by the COAG process, at that time, the Senator Birmingham, who was then the shadow parliamentary secretary. That is, he was in the opposition and the opposition and the government at that time both affirmed the value of the NWC. Simon Birmingham actually said the following, the NWC's role is integral to getting water reform right in this country at a much broader level. As we go forward, their role in holding the states and the Commonwealth to account for actually delivering on water reform is critical. Their role in providing expert advice and analysis is absolutely critical. Senator Birmingham went on and said, we need good, credible, independent organisations such as the National Water Commission to call it as they see it, to call it based on the facts, to call it based on expert evidence, and to hold governments to account for the key policies that they have set out on. Pretty important stuff coming from the uh, then shadow parliamentary secretary. So the gov both governments passed the bill with bipartisan support in June 2012, continuing the existence of the National Water Commission and the COAG governance arrangements that we did. But look, since then, so much has happened now. We have lost that, both the COAG process and we have lost the NWC. The good thing is that we do have the Productivities Commission's current review of water reform in Australia, whose draft plan was delivered uh, uh, 10 days ago. And I hope that that policy uh, platform in the Productivity Commission can be the beginning of turning the tide. Five minutes, John. Right. Minutes. So I, I feel that if we look at it, what that commission came up with was, as I go to share this, okay, you can see the key, key points they make in the PC is that there's been a lot of progress. But you see the reforms, priorities are there, they include. And many of these are the same ones that have been brought up by those three independent bodies, the ATSI, Wentworth, and the Institute and AWA. But what's interesting is that these, this report, however, doesn't have any way forward in saying who will do it, what's the leadership, the governance arrangements for putting these important things. So the Productivity Commission's report has, says a lot of the things we need to do, and that's good. And, but it doesn't have any guidance at the moment, and it's a draft report, on the leadership, the governance arrangements to drive the, the reform process and the governance of it and the compliance of it into the future. And then if I go, however, what we do need to realise that after three years we've got to this from the Productivity Commission, when in fact if we go back to the National Water Commission uh, 
documents back on the uh, 2014, they all saying the same thing. Government should not backtrack on water reform. Government should not mark their own scorecards. That's a good one. So we, what I do want to just say in the time available is that we now have a, a productivity draft commission draft report which is basically saying the same things as what we said in the uh, report at the end of the Natural Water Commission's time, except that then we still had National Water Commission and the COAG processes in place. So we've got the same ideas, what we need to do, it's clear, but we haven't got any idea of how we're going to do it. So that is the big challenge ahead of us, because I think if we don't put the governance uh, processes in place of a, of a body that can actually hold governments to accord to their policy development and their compliance, we then have the situation like we've had with the recent report of, um, of, Ma of Ken Matthews showing that a premier state like New South Wales doesn't have in place any of the mechanisms that we need for a modern uh, evaluation and compliance of the policy that they've put in place. So we need to get the governance and leadership and we need to get back on the bike with water policy development across Australia because there are many states and I think Northern Territory is one, so you've got a group that really have a fair way to go I think. I'll be happy if you correct me on this. Fair way to go in implementing NWI principles in water development, but we must. So let's get back on the bike and we need you folks to help us do that. Thank you. John, that's an absolutely fantastic discussion on the position we're in for such a time as this. Uh, a voice of reason and passion. Hugely appreciate the um, effort you've gone into this. I can hear what you're saying, as we all can. Mark their own scorecard. What a fantastic line to bring in. Well, well we see it just didn't work in uh, New South Wales. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. I, I so appreciate it. And so much needed in Australia. The voice of uh, reason and passion like yours. It reminds me of Peter Cullen to some extent. But right now, much needed. Um, look, there's a few questions coming in and there's a few people listening in, what's more. Can I just say welcome to the uh, Duna Group in South Australia, Department of Water, Environment, Water and Natural Resources. Uh, great to see you. There you all are. Um, on, a, on the big wide screen, who can I see that I know there? Oh, yeah, there's quite a few people there. I know there, but I'm not mark any names out there, pick anybody out. But thank you also, everyone. Uh, Sherry, you've got a group together in Northern Territory also uh, in the Darwin Department of, of Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, so pleased to see you could join us. There's a large group uh, here today and there's a lot of questions coming up, so I won't waste any more time. Raise your hand if you want to ask a question on screen. We'd love that to happen. We'll uplift you to the screen and you can, you can be seen in full living colour. Uh, if not, write your questions as many are doing right now. So, John, the uh, first question that uh, I can see here right now is, I'm keen to hear, this one here, I'm keen to hear John's thoughts on the Productivity Commission's draft report. Does it go far enough in its call for a renewed NWI? Okay, that's a really important question. I, I think it, it raises most of the, it does a very good job at literature review. If you were grading it as a PhD, you'd say, yes, you've got a good literature review, but we're really a bit light on of how you actually turn what needs to be done, and they've identified them quite well. Some, a couple, I think, have been missed, but what is mostly missing is how do we bring about the leadership and governance to make sure we can drive the process when we no longer have a, a commission and we no longer have a COAG agreement. So yes, full marks for identifying most of the issues that we need to get our head around. I would add a couple that they need to do more on. Water use efficiency and return flows needs a lot more attention. I think R&D needs to make sure we've got the knowledge basis to go forward is missing, but the main one that's missing is the provision of governance and leadership options that we can take to government to say, look, we must have independent assessment so governments aren't marking their own score sheets, but we need to do it in the governance in a way so that these commissions cannot readily and easily be dismissed as the NWC could be because it was reporting to the same minister who was uh, having his scorecard reported on. Doesn't work. 
we've got to look at that different. In my experience in the National Water, in the Natural Resources Commission in New South Wales, while it's only a tiny little body, it has been more effective because it reports directly to the Premier and Cabinet. That, that's great. Yep, that's good. Marina uh, Barbosa from uh, Victoria is a researcher. She, she says, hi, thanks for your presentation. I'd like to understand your opinion about the governance arrangements between the Australian water policy and the state policies. Yeah, well, they had been developed with agreements bet- uh, coming out of the COAG arrangements where, in fact, we had a COAG committee which dealt with water particularly and that body had arms and legs through the National Water Commission. All that is gone at the moment. So I think we're really leaderless. I don't think there's anyone at the bridge. There's no one in the wheelhouse. And that needs to be addressed. That's excellent. Uh, Bridget Morrison in Tasmania, Farmers and Grazers Association, has asked, is the apparent trend toward centralisation of water governance a consequence of cost rationalisation or are there benefits to be had from centralisation? Yeah, I think that's a very important question to that. There are times when there's some things that are worth centralising, but I think in the PC, in the Productivity Commission report, there's some good material and there's also good material in some of those other reports that say that really in the end of the day we want to mix. We want to have local and regional input and control over, say, environmental water and how and best to use that water. And uh, I think there's a centralised place, but I think we need to be getting the balance right. And I think we're moving, in my judgment, much too much to a centralised approach. Yeah. Uh, I'll keep moving on. Uh, There's a few more questions coming in, quite a few, actually. John Marie Baker is at um, Namoy Water, Exec Officer. Ken Matthews failed to recognise that the DPI water was restructured for 18 months and the review process was not implemented. Not that the process was lacking. You cannot remove 22 senior level managers and still ensure compliance functions. Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a definitely a comment. Yeah. Take that as a comment. Yeah, well, it's an important comment. I think yeah. we have had a hollowing out of water capacity across our state agencies. I certainly know that to be true in New South Wales because I've kept the track of it. The number of people who have got competence in groundwater modelling to be able to do anything about compliance in the in the gas industries as well as in the the other industries, the irrigation industries, is very thin on the ground. I think Queensland might have come out of it better, and South Australia has always done a good job in many ways to do that. Um, but I think we have had a hollowing out in in good um, skills in water sciences. Uh, well, well, maybe then we can keep going with John Murray's uh, comments here. There's a lack of coordination between land and water management. Yes. NWC and NWI do not touch on these issues in detail. We had this under Land Water Australia, recognising that water alone does not achieve outcomes. Water That's alone. Right. Yeah. How, does the re- how does this report address the gap? Well, I, don't, I think it has a, has a section saying that you've got to get the land management and the water management integrated and together. And one of the things that I think we've missed in our water reform to date, we haven't used catchment management authorities and regional management that can do that integration adequately. We've ignored the capacity and the knowledge that I knew existed in both the Victorians and in the New South Wales catchment authorities and some of the national uh, natural resource bodies else in the other states. They tend to be, um, there's always this competition between the major agencies and these regional bodies. And I think that reform is needed badly because when you do get water sharing planning that links across to biodiversity planning and land management, there's no point flooding a floodplain that's been grazed to its knees. It's useless. And so we've got to do both things. And I've seen some good work being done by catchment management authorities and natural resource bodies Uh, when the governments of the day are able to get the balance between the major agencies of the state and the actual regional agencies. Yep, no, that that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, NT, I can see you there thinking about a few questions and writing a few things. If you have any, fire away. Uh, John will will be more than glad to hear from you. Yes. Um, All right, here we go. Madeline is from uh, New South Wales and... uh, in the hot seat as a state, I guess. Thanks for your presentation. I'm interested in your thoughts on Ken Matthews' report recommendation of an independent regulator charged with pursuing compliance 
but yep. falling under the Department of Industry, the body that reports says failed to do this in the first place. Yeah, well, I'd argue, I, I think that's the point I just made, and I, I think Ken and I would have a good debate on this. I've mm. uh, got enormous respect for his integrity. I think the point is you want to have the reporting structures uh, independent of those you're actually reporting on. That's a basic yeah. tenant of governance. Yeah. And I think if that isn't a matter of fact, and I guess you're struggling in Australia, I think, and is our democracy matures, how do we have... Uh, statutory authorities that can speak the truth on a matter and report it uh, for the benefit of the public good uh, and, but not be all at, always at the risk of being abolished if it offends a minister. So or frank and client. fearless. And it's, and it's something that I think there's many instances now and the energy debate we're in is a good illustration of not having some of those and I think what's happened in New South Wales and I imagine it equally could happen in the other states is that I do think the sort of have having independent statutory authorities that report, have a reporting process and a, a financial responsibility to the Premier and Cabinet or the Prime Minister and Cabinet has to be one of the issues we need to hold. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. I think it's an issue we need to think hard about and understand and be quite clear about the governance arrangements. You can't have an auditing body who's auditing someone they're also reporting to. Mm, yep, no, well said, well said. There's one here, whilst unbundling of water rights appears to work well for large river systems, especially cross-jurisdictional, it has significant limitations for managing groundwater systems. Do you think perhaps in this case we need to take a step backwards to bundle or semi-bundle licences to then allow policy for the management of groundwater to move forward? Yes, I'd agree with you, and that's one of the issues that's raised in those papers by Carmody. I suggest, I mean, you may, you probably already know the literature better than I do, but if you have a look at some of Carmody's uh, summaries and the legal, there is some times when the licensing and just turning them into tradable licences without understanding the groundwater system and how it needs to be managed uh, is absolutely something that is part of this review process and policy development that I'm arguing for. It's exactly what we need to do. Markets and property rights work well when you set up the regulatory framework around their function and make sure the regulations allow them to function as they hydrologically do. Then you can trade water backwards and forwards appropriately. But if you just start trading something in a system that has no frame around it, it is very dangerous. I can't imagine how water would look if it went the same way as energy reform. I, I, well, won't, even, I, I won't even go I, I there. Think, I, that's the point I didn't make during the time. But, uh, but look, I, I think unless we get back on the bike to do those sorts of things that you just brought up about groundwater, but there's many, many of them, we've made really good progress. Let's not back off on that. But right. it's not enough. And mm. we don't want to end up in the situation with energy that when you've got the crisis is not the time to do the policy development. The policy development is with good knowledge and research is before you've got a crisis. And we saw the value of that, as I showed you before, with uh, water trading in the drought. But this next question, I think you might have covered it already. I'd be interested to hear what leadership or governance arrangements should be put in place. Well, I don't think we've had enough discussion on that. Mm. I, I personally think what we had before with the Water Commission and, and that uh, seemed, seemed good, but clearly it failed. And, uh, and what we have in New South Wales, as Ken Matthews reports, has it's failed. I think we need to have an honest, hard discussion and across political parties on this. We've got to be bipartisan on how we guarantee water security for Australia and energy security and food security. We can't have this bickering at each other and, and structures and implementation arrangements that fall over and put us all at risk. That's not on. That's absolutely what I said. I think I'm going to make this the last question. So hang in there the last, the last few minutes here. Uh, I, I, it's been outstanding. I want I th people to say what I've got wrong because that's how the yeah. only way you learn. So if there's something I've got asked about, tell me. That will be really useful. Come on, you lot. Have a, have a, have a shot. Have a go. He's giving you the open flatter to do this. <laughs> well, here's one that was uh, knocked around the, the office here today, John. I thought Australia was well ahead on water reform. Got us through the millennial drought pretty well. What happened? Here's the last one. Are our current bumps evidence that science is necessary but insufficient? 
Well, I think that that we that we, we we certainly have done a great job marketing around the world. That Australia has done some really revolutionary and important things in water reform. That's so, and this gave us a feeling that therefore we can get off the bike and sit in the shade. We can't because. These issues that we've talked about, and particularly the climate change and the population, are on the agenda, and we've got to get back on that bike and keep pedalling. And the the point that I would argue that we got through many of these things because we had a good research base of water sciences, social sciences, economic sciences to build on. We must keep building that base if we want to have good evidence-based policy. And I see an erosion of that uh, research agenda and it's something the academy particularly is concerned about. And I guess that so are the universities. The trouble is the government will say that's in self-interest, you know, for the university research universities, so we need more money for water research. Well, we do. If we want to have the knowledge base in economics, social sciences and the biophysical sciences to build a good policy future for a country like Australia. Well, you definitely stir, stir some, some trouble. John Murray comes back with John. I think you have it wrong about Matt, Ken Matthews' report. It doesn't state that the framework in New South Wales failed. What it said is that the process was not implemented. Well, that's the exactly Matthews my point. It failed us. because it wasn't implemented. Okay. So it's not just having a framework. It's having a governance in place to make sure the compliance happens. We've got lots of frameworks. They're fine and the implementation can happen. But in the end, you've got to have someone in the wheelhouse. Yep, keeping keeping the um, keeping the, the car going in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Hey, um, we're going to leave it there. Um, I think getting back on the bike, not sitting in the shade, is probably the take-home message here. And uh, we're so indebted to you, John, for your time and effort in this. Hugely appreciate your time. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, this is the the last thing you'll see on this webinar. There's more questions coming in, but we, we might have to leave it there, I think. We'll come and do this again. Uh, would you be on that, John? Yeah, if, it's, if, the, if the folks think it's interesting and we can... Because yeah. I saw some of those questions, and particularly with regard to South Australia, and, and, and in fact, can their, 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 their legislation is more amenable to adapting to climate change, I'd have to say that, and I think that's good. I mean, South Australia, yeah. without trying to pick favourites, has, has sought to be progressive and deal with these matters when it was out of fashion in other places. Sure. Okay, so feedback form. As soon as you close down, you'll see a feedback form. Just tick a few boxes. It's going to take you less than a minute. It will shape these future webinars. There's going to be a recording emailed out to everybody. There's half a dozen or more free webinars coming up in the near future. Take a note of them. And there's a, a great course about managed aquifer recharge happening at the end of October in Perth, which is uh, fast filling. We're heading well and truly That's toward the uh, end of time. Yeah. All right. Thank you again, John. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll thank look you. forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you for all your questions and for your patience with me. I appreciate it. It's been great. Thank you again. Bye for now.